So here we will look at Brezhnev's um, economic policies, most specifically looking at the agricultural and wrapping everything up by looking at the impact on people's uh, living standards. So the learning objectives are to understand the main features of the agricultural aspect of the um, Soviet economy under Brezhnev and to assess the reasons for such Compare and contrast the econ um, economic, that is the agricultural policies, under Khrushchev and Brezhnev. As discussed previously, agriculture has historically been sort of like the weakest link within the um, economy of the Soviet Union. And under Brezhnev, this does not change overall, although there are some changes in agriculture. So one of the things that they did in the Brezhnev era is they maintained many of the agricultural policies that Khrushchev had set. And what you have during this time is sort of like this recognition of the fragility of the agricultural system. And therefore, they um, increase agricultural investment. Something like by 1980, 25% of all government investment was in agriculture. But keep in mind what I said previously about the inability to move toward intensive. The government increased the prices paid to collective farms. Uh, again, that um, incentivizing people to work hard. But um, the prices of agricultural goods had to be um, maintained at a comfortable level for the people living in cities. So they're trying to incentivize the workers, but at the same time, they can't have prices jump up for people in the cities because that would make them really unhappy. So they have to try to maintain a happy population. And so what that means is agricultural prices are heavily subsidized by the government. And this is going to be one of those things that ultimately um, helps to sort of break down uh, the Soviet system. It just isn't uh, sustainable. There is a continued increase in the size of collective farms. Um, as we spoke about earlier, in this way, in the communist mindset was bigger is better. And so increase in the collective farms, the idea is that it would make it um, make them more efficient. Um, but the increasing the sizes only is worthwhile if you can also intensively use it. That means that it, you have, it has to be heavily, heavily mechanized. Um, and we still have the problem with machines rusting and people not being able to use them as intensely as possible. They also loosened the restrictions on private plots. So this was a bit of a change. So what this means though is that more people are farming on their private plots and people can still um, make money off of them and enjoy their profits and decide on what they're going to plant. So uh, one of the things that's happening with the collective farms is as they're increasing in size, they're becoming more and more specialized on one type of crop. And so on these private plots, now you can maybe grow in smaller quantities the things that people may want um, that way you can then sell at a higher price and make more profit. There is this sort of improvement of lives of people on collective farms. Remember that collective farms are different from the state farms. Collective farms, essentially, the people still own it just now as a collective versus the entire state or the government owning the farm. And because this was a holdover of capitalism, uh, these guys were heavily oppressed and they didn't get the same amount of treatment that other people did. And so here, again, trying to incentivize the workers, they um, allow the workers to have internal passports. So this means that, the, the, that they can move throughout the country before they were tied to the farm in the area that they were from. Collective farm workers are now entitled to government pensions, which they weren't before, and a minimum wage. Before, they were paid basically based on the number of days work and the productivity of the farm. Now they have some of the same benefits that people in cities do. And the thing, though, is that it actually does um, improve 
uh, farming, the, um, the private plots and the collective farms. And by 1980, even though these private uh, plots only make up 4% of the land in the country, they are producing 30% of the food. So the incentivizing of people with their private plots really did work. And there's also an expansion of farm-related industries. So within the cities, this idea of um, increasing uh, plants that uh, produce fertilizer, that produce um, farm equipment. But keep in mind that this is also going to have to be balanced with meeting the needs of the military. There's an increased use of fertilizers, that um, fertilizing the land is, is more intensively using the land, trying to get more of it, um, more out of it. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that um, even though they maintained a number of Khrushchev's agricultural policies, the, they are no more campaigns. There's no more sort of that verve, that um, spirit to change things, that um, energy that you had in Khrushchev's time. So you don't have campaigns like the Virgin Land campaigns. Um, you don't have things like the bringing of maize. Obviously, the maize thing was a bit of a failure, but there are things that could have been done. For example, in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, the West had seen what is called the Green Revolution, where there was this really massive development in um, different types of seeds and uh, drought resistant plants and so on and so forth. So that could have been something that they adopted instead of corn, but um, ultimately part of that maintaining stability maintaining the status quo is no uh, campaigns it's going to be like low energy despite all of these changes they could not meet the dietary needs of the people yes there was an improvement in in agricultural production but it couldn't meet demand and reasons for this are myriad this includes the fact that unlike um, other ministers, like for different industrial sectors, the agricultural ministers did not hold on to their positions for the long term. And what this meant is that um, people wouldn't, weren't uh, nursing along their programs. Um, there was not enough time of anybody in power to really see um, uh the the big picture so there just wasn't like a unified policy because people were in and out the farms could not keep technical staff uh this is the thing that we talked about earlier in terms of the people um on the uh machine tractor stations if you had technical skills a lot of people would leave the rural areas. They would move to the cities where they could get um, better pay, where they could have a better quality of life and things to do. So you still have machinery rusting in the fields and that contributes the inability to intensively use what they had. The um, farmers uh, wanted to focus their energies on their private plots. The private plots was where they made money. And so um, it was really hard getting people to work hard, as hard on the collective um, as on their own private uh, areas. There's also this massive lack of innovation. And we mentioned it previously, but now this is innovation specifically for the agricultural sector. Uh, I already mentioned the green revolution and sort of like the development of high yield um, grains and drought resistant and pest resistant um, strains of, uh, of grains. <laughs> but um, so there's this lack of innovation in that aspect. But on one of the um, state farms, the chairman figured out a way that the grain could be produced at one third of the cost and thereby um, multiplying the income of the team on that on that farm three times oh this was not good the chairman was arrested 
and thrown into prison where he died because his whole project and his whole idea threatened the whole structure of Soviet agriculture with the farms and the government ministers in charge, etc., and the centralized planning. And um, it also had a of capitalism, and that is a no, no, because it's trying to incentivize the farmers through profit, large amounts of profit at that. So ultimately, um, the Soviet Union had to continue importing grain from the U.S. and from Argentina to be able to meet the dietary needs of the population. So if we look at our hand at any chart here, we can see the grain harvest from 62 to 81 in uh, millions of tons. And one of the things we see here is there's a huge amount of fluctuation in terms of production. In 1963, it was only 100 million tons, whereas in 1978, we have 235 million. So what you see here is that it, um, the agricultural sector is still quite vulnerable to the um, weather conditions. And this is despite all of the investment that is being made and the use of fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera. And if we look at this other handy dandy chart, we can see here the growth of agricultural output in the five-year averages looking at different types of uh, important aspects of food um, and agricultural production because most people don't eat cotton. I guess maybe you could try it, but I wouldn't. Uh, and so before, um, in the 1960s, you can see that agricultural growth was something at like 4% per year. But by the time we get into the 70s, that is slowed to like 1.2%. So again, having difficulty meeting the demand of uh, this population and necessitating the importing of food from outside the country. So let's take a look at what all of this means for the people in the Soviet Union. One of the aspects that is often used to examine the robustness of an economy is the amount of savings. Under Brezhnev, we have a massive in increase in savings from 19 billion in 1965 to 221 billion in 1985. Now, economists would normally say that this is a sign of healthy and vigorous economy and the um, living standards are increasing rapidly and the economy is so good that people have extra money to save. But in the case of the Soviet Union, mm, that's not so much the case. Basically, um, people were getting more money, but sometimes the consumer goods were such poor quality that there was nothing for them to spend money on. So on one hand, they're still having some difficulty getting the food that they need. Consumer goods are, are becoming increasingly available, but they're crappy. All right, so the cost of living was still high despite the government uh, subsidies. So um, just looking at it, an average worker in Russia in 79 worked four and one half hours to earn enough money to buy a loaf of bread. In the US, that would have been 48 minutes. So people spent a huge amount of their time waiting in lines trying to get food. And even though the government was heavily subsidizing um, agricultural goods within the country, a lot of it still had to be imported, not enough, and people um, spent a larger amount of money on it than they should or could have. But diet is improving. Um, as we saw from the previous chart, there was uh, an improvement in um, the production of grains and stuff like this. Um, so nutrition is improving, even though people are still heavily dependent on bread and potatoes. But um, there are regional variations in the availability of goods. So if you were in some place like Moscow or Leningrad, sort of like near the political capitals, then you could get um, anything that you want, um, well, within reason. 
but if you were out in the smaller towns um, you couldn't find stuff in the shops but um, the government did heavily subsidize rail and air transport as well as public transport in industrial areas and the result of this is that uh, there's some really weird inefficiencies within the system so it was so cheap to travel and especially now that we have these passports for the collective farmers you would see trains and planes full of um, housewives leaving the capital so people would travel from the countryside to Moscow to buy the food and stuff that they can't get at home and it was cheaper to do that because of this um, the other thing is that peasants from the eastern part of the country would fly to Moscow with bags of whatever they have like their lemons, their fruit, whatever, and sell it in the private markets and make a lot of money because these goods were so scarce. Um, the accommodation was very cheap, but it was poorly built. There is no sort of, um, how do you say, quality control. So um, door frames weren't square, roofs leaks, um, roofs leaks, roofs leak <laughs> and um, like the walls would get damp and grow mold the elevators didn't work and what what mattered instead of quality was that quotas were being met so something discussed in the um, industrial portion as well but the government did provide free heating for people in the coldest areas. So it's, it's a little hard to say whether it was fully successful or not because some aspects of it were good. Here we have a handy dandy picture of uh, this was taken in the 70s and it shows um, people basically selling their goods including um, hooves of cows. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but in this, in this time period, as well as under Stalin, people used their contacts, whether it was stuff, whether it was um, services, people used the people that they knew to get stuff done. So they weren't using official channels. And what this means is there is a large black market for imported goods. I told you guys the story before. There's a large black market for foreign currency because that allows you to buy stuff. And there's a large um, black market for illegally produced vodka because um, rates of alcoholism were very, very high. Um, and the, the thing about this black market is that it actually allowed for the functioning of the planned economy because the black market was the actual market that was responsive to supply and demand. And so the things that people needed, that's where they got it from because the official government places, the official economy wasn't able to supply it. And so one of the interesting things that happens, of course, when a system like this is the government is being raided for supplies to be sold on the black market. So people, um, it, I think this says something like a third of private cars were run on government petrol instead of people buying their own. Um, people uh, always were liberating things from their place of work. So it could be like car parts, it could be material, it could be food, it could be opera tickets, um, whatever people wanted. If it was there for the, in the government, then there was somebody willing to liberate it from the government and make it available to the masses on the black market. And as you can see here, the lifestyle of the elite was vastly different from the masses. So here we have um, Brezhnev having uh, champagne uh, in the U.S. with uh, the president. 
Um, so they, they're having a sort of luxurious life that other people do not. So um, they, for example, like Brezhnev collected foreign cars because as one does, and he had holiday homes around the country so that he could reward some of his supporters with access to these holiday homes. So ultimately, we have a huge amount of cynicism um, toward politics and politicians. So it's not just the elite who are no longer ideologically bent, but also the masses as well. Surprise! Although I'm pretty sure at this point it's not much of a surprise. But anyway, let's move on. Knock, knock. Who's there? Amsterdam. Amsterdam who? Amsterdam tired of your lies. <laughs> Sorry. You know you love it. And I leave you with gator colors. Orange and blue. Whoop, whoop.